All right, hello. It's another week of coronavirus online learning brought to you by uh, Mr. Nelson. I'm hope you I hope you're having a good time. Um, keeping yourselves occupied. It's nice weather. Hopefully you're going outside but not near people, so I don't know, doing something productive. Um, what I want to do this week is I want to walk through what we learned about the AP test and kind of, you know, discuss it a little bit more and then outline what I want to do for the next couple weeks as we approach the AP test. It's right around the corner. Um, and so that's what I want to discuss. So the first thing that uh, we need to address is I got an email from College Board asking me to review with you guys what students have actually re-registered. Most of you guys already registered, but then after coronavirus, they must have sent a bunch of you emails and said that you need to log in just to confirm that you're going to be testing from home or something like that. So it was like a survey and they gave me a, um, a sheet of people who's actually done it. So I'm going to post that right now so you guys can see it. All right. So you, there you see it on my screen. Um, those students who responded and are currently planning to take a test, they're at the top. Everybody else is kind of thrown into this unknown category. Uh, like I said, I didn't get the email, so I don't know what, what it was actually asking you to do, but somehow you're supposed to click on a link and confirm that you're still planning on taking the test, and many of you have not done that. So I encourage you this next week um, to find that email, click the link, and um, I guess re-register. I will check this again you know, every week and let you know where we're at so we can get everybody on board, um, but I encourage you to do that so we can get that issue resolved. So let's talk about the AP start time. Your test is on May 13th at 11 o'clock. Um, it's 11 o'clock Pacific time. Is, we're gonna go to the Pacific time zone even though we're really Mountain Standard time, but because we're Arizona, we don't do daylight savings, we put this in Pacific time. So 11 o'clock, May 13th. I don't think you're gonna have a whole lot of play in that. I think you're gonna have to be there right at 11 and be ready to go. Um, there, I mean, they're only giving you five minutes to upload the assignments. My guess is, you know, by 11, what is that, 11.50, everything's gonna be uploaded uh, for this time zone so that they can make sure they get the next time zone in. Uh, but anyway, that's the way it's gonna work. Uh, if 11 is inconvenient to you, just realize that the uh, time for the kids in Japan is 1 a.m. If you're taking it in Guam, it's 2 a.m. Uh, anyway, so they're, everyone's scattered depending on their time zone, so 11 o'clock is not the worst time in the world. So then let's talk about the essays that you guys wrote. I've graded all those. You've seen the comments. If you've cared to look, I put the actual grade inside the uh, College Board comments section. I, I guess I'm just curious to see uh, how easy that is for you guys to access. Uh, but overall, I was I was quite content. I feel like you guys are writing better as you type, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, two areas of concern. One, I'm, I'm worried a little bit about some of your guys' thesis statements. There's still a few of you who are not actually hitting any sort of defensible argument, so I want to talk about that. And then the second thing is uh, the actual depthness, that sophistication point, right? Are you really hitting a complex meaning overall? If you remember, it was that piece, uh, what's it called? The Rise of Silas Latham. It's about that family, really, really reclusive family. And so, you know, most of you guys picked up on the fact that the family's a little bit weird, but some of you didn't know what to do with the weirdness. But you can talk about the weirdness, right? You can talk about how reclusive they are, how they only care about themselves, and how when they go out in public, they kind of just stay off to the sidelines. That's not normal, right? It's by its very definition, abnormal, right? Most people are socializing. They're the oddballs that are socializing. What does that mean about this family? The father kind of discourages people from visiting. This is kind of the same theme I've been pushing for the last several weeks simply because it's intriguing to me um, in this period of time, which is our interactions with the family, right? I, I gave you, you know, all those Faulkner stuff. I gave you yellow wallpaper, and I'm giving you this essay where, once again, you have family dynamics. You have these you know, siblings, and they're really into their own selves, right? They're kind of absorbed by their own family um, dynamic, influenced a lot by the parents, right? Dad doesn't want anyone over. Mom is really rural and rustic, so she doesn't care that much about going out there. Somehow they have lots of money, so they actually can afford to go on vacation, so they go out there. But they don't have that same sophistication that comes with money, right? They don't fit well into that same society. You could have discussed that. When we talk about sophistication, talking in detail about what it would be like for somebody of a certain social class who doesn't fit into a social class to try to adjust and adapt is significant, right? You could have talked about that. 
you could have talked about in detail the dynamics of a family. What is it? How does it affect you if your parents are a little bit crazy? Does it change you in any way? Certainly it does, right? If all of your instruction comes from a certain group of individuals and those individuals have a kind of wonky way of looking at things, if they're abnormally shy in some way, chances are you're going to be abnormally shy. That's not even your fault. That's just the way the world works. That's just your, you know, all the triggers in your life are pushing you in that direction. And then finally, the part that I found most significant is imagine if you had this close-knit family or everybody's kind of into themselves and then all of a sudden one of those members of that family strays. They start to, you know, they have a love interest. And so they start to look at uh, accept acceptance from people outside the family. What does that do once that individual who starts questioning the values they grew up with, but also to the family dynamic itself. Um, so I found that part very interesting. Some of you guys picked up on that, but when we're talking about sophistication points, that's what we're talking about. It's not enough to talk about just simply diction or you know tone or whatever you wanna talk about. You've gotta kinda of talk about this much deeper idea that's being presented by this piece. That you... Now let's talk about the assignments for the next couple of weeks. As I see it, uh, we really just have this next week uh, for me to assign anything. The week after that is, I would consider the last week of the school year before APs. And so if anything else, it needs to be more of a review. And that's what I plan to do. So um, next week, I'll probably have a long lecture where I'm just kind of reviewing everything I think you need to know going into the AP test. And then uh, we'll just go from there. And I'll probably open up all the questions on the My AP uh, or on the College Board website. So you can, you know, if you want to write essays and practice, you certainly can but I don't feel like I should give you any more material while you're actually taking other AP tests. So this week, I've just got a reading assignment and then my AP assignment, um, you know, just kind of doing the same old thing. The reading assignment is called Sweat by Zora Neale Hurston. I, I have a tendency to oversell stuff that I like and I wanna be cautious of overselling Sweat, but I will say, I love Zora Neale Hurston. There are not a lot of people I say I love, but I love Zora Neale Hurston. And simply because I've got nothing better to do and because you guys are stuck watching the video, I want to talk briefly about her life story because she is a phenomenal person that's worthy of some discussion. Um, for me, Zora Neale Hurston is one of those authors who lived such an extraordinary life and is such a good author that she adds a unique perspective to the world. If you read literature for the reasons I read literature, which is you know to allow me to understand someone else's position and you know perspective and everything, uh, Zora Neale Hurston is is phenomenal. Um, she writes in such a way that she is capable of you know kind of transporting you into this time period into this world, and at the same time, her perspective on the world is so unique and unusual for that period of time that I find everything she does just incredible, right? Okay, so I'm trying not to oversell it, but I probably am. Um, you see some information up there about her life, where she was born, but really, here's what I want you to understand. She lived in the South. Her family's descended from, descended from slaves, and she finds herself growing up in a segregated South, but in a unique position where the town she grew up in was all black. It was the first all black incorporated town in the United States. So it, what it, that means is they had a black mayor, they have a black city council, they have a black sheriff, right? So think about all the problems you have with segregation. And now imagine that you have a town where all the authority figures are part of this, are, 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 are black, right? So everybody's running the town are black. And so for her, she grew up in that period she didn't really see racism in the same way that a lot of people see racism, right? When we read Invisible Man, um, we understand Ellison's, Ellison's uh, troubles, his tribulations. We understand how he's perceived. We understand his anger. Zora Neale Hurston doesn't grow up angry. She doesn't grow up in this with this chip on her shoulder where she wants to get back at everybody. She grows up as a girl just in a town, right? And so... Um, she talks about a town, so you get to understand, you know, what it's like in this first black town as you read your stories. Oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to talk about really fast is, so in the midst of living in this town, her mom dies at an early age. Put that into the perspective, right? Imagine losing your mother at a young age. 
Her father remarries and then sends her away. At the age of 13, she gets sent away to a larger town and is expected to live there. She goes to the boarding school. Um, she's in the boarding school for a little bit. I think money runs out. And then she's, she's kicked out of this boarding school. And all of a sudden at the age of 13, she's living now in a segregated South, far away from all of her social ne- social network, right? Everything that she kind of relies upon. Um, and now she's just working, right? Finding ways to make money. That's crazy. That's fascinating in my opinion. Um, She's very good at writing, so she starts writing for newspapers, um, only black student at Columbia University. And then this is the other part that I find fascinating. She becomes intrigued by anthropology, and she starts to um, investigate those sorts of things and very curious about the South and you know black and white sort of intermixing. She starts to do a whole lot of stuff with the Columbia Anthropology Department. Travels extensively throughout South America, Central America, and the United States, studying dialects and all those sorts of things. And so, everything else that we read from her is not just founded from her perspective growing up in this, I don't know, all black southern town, but also from her studies and academic studies. She's incredibly intelligent, um, you know, kind of pushed the envelope on a bunch of these issues that were happening in the South. Um, Moves to Harlem, becomes friends with Langston Hughes. So she's part of this Harlem Renaissance that we talked about at the very beginning of the year. So she fits into that paradigm as well. Um, Last part I want to talk about. She's noted for her authentic representation of colloquial dialogue. And you're going to see that when you read Sweat. I really, really wanted to read this in class. There are a few stories that I look forward to reading in class. I want to read uh, Hamlet with you guys in class, but I really wanted to read this short story in class. The reason why I wanted to read this in class is because I feel like this is one of those short stories that needs to be read aloud. And as you read it, you'll notice that the dialogue is phonetic. So you you almost have to speak it out loud to understand what's being said. And so I encourage you to do that, right? So if you're like me, you read in your head, but when it comes to these dialogue pieces, you need to kind of stop and speak it out loud um, to sound it out, to see what's happening. But what you do when you do that is you start to understand the way in which um, the people Zora's portrayed talk, right? How do they interact? And she, she starts to portray that in a certain way. When she did that, I find it interesting. But then again, I'm just a white guy from Yavapai County, right? Um, for some individuals, from some people in the African American community, they took a, they objected to it. They felt like she was kind of uh, drawing attention to the uneducatedness of these individuals, right? That she was kind of portraying. Um, her culture in a wrong light. And so she got a lot of pushback, mainly for some of the people we've talked about throughout this year. Um, I've got a couple of quotes I'll show you right now. Yeah. So I want to read this. Indulge me. I just got a couple more slides, but I want to read this because it shows it perfectly what her life was right. So this is Zora Neale Hurston talking about herself in a book titled How It Feels to Be Colored Me. And she said, I remember the very day that I became colored. Up to my 13th year, I lived in the little Negro town of Eatonville, Florida. It is exclusively a colored town. The only white people I knew passed through the town going to or coming from Orlando. But changes came in the family when I was 13 and I was sent to school in Jacksonville. I left Eatonville, the town of the Orleanders, Azora. When I disembarked from the riverboat at Jacksonville, she was no more. It seemed that I had suffered a sea change. I was not Zora of Orange County anymore. I was now a little colored girl. I found it out in certain ways, in my heart as well as in the mirror. I became a fast brown, warranted not to rub nor run but I'm not tragically colored. There's no great sorrow dammed up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all but about it. Even the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong regardless of a little pigmentation more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife. That's Zora Neale Hurston, right? Perfect, right? She's not angry at the world. She didn't grow up with this chip on her shoulder, just pissed off at everything. She grew up in a completely different world, but she still recognizes what it means to be colored. She still recognizes segregation and all the error of those ways, right? But the perspective that she looks at is so much different from everything else. But like I said, controversial. Okay, I got one other thing. Richard Wright, we talked about Richard Wright. Here's someone who does not like her, right? Miss Hurston can write, 
but her prose is cloaked in the facile sensuality that has dogged Negro expression since the days of Phyllis Wheatley. Her dialogue manages to catch the psychological movements of the Negro folk mind in their pure simplicity, but that's as far as it goes. Miss Hurston voluntarily continues in her novel the tradition which was forced upon the Negro in the theater, that is, the minstrel technique that makes the white folks laugh. Her characters eat and laugh and cry and work and kill. They swing like a pendulum eternally in that safe and narrow orbit in which America likes to see the Negro live, between laughter and tears. The sensory sweep of her novel carries no theme, no message, no thought. In the main, her novel is not addressed to the Negro, but to a white audience whose chauvinistic taste she knows how to satisfy. She exploits the phase of Negro life which is quaint, the phase which evokes a piteous smile on the lips of the superior race. <laughs> so... I just built up Mrs. Zora Neale Hurston and say how much I like her. And then Richard Wright says, of course I like her. I'm the white audience that she's writing to, right? I'm the one that she's betraying her race to portray. And she writes, you know, just to entertain me. Holy moly. Yeah, I'm entertained. I don't know what to say with that. I, you know, it's one of those things that I love that conflict that, that's presented. Um, so I'm going to ask you to read Sweat by Zora Neale Hurston. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I want to, just a paragraph, introductory paragraph to a potential essay that talks about the role that the dialogue plays in portraying the novel. Here's that, that's the controversy, right? She writes in such a way that she feels she's allowing people to understand what these guys are thinking and saying. People like Richard Wright say, well, this is ridiculing it. It's putting it on theater. It's putting it on stage so people can observe it. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to hit something deeper with a theme and message. Um, so I want you to comment on that. Uh, I think you'll like it. And finally, the um, AP practice essay I have for you today um, is called The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle. I picked this mainly because, well, I have an order in which I get kind of give you essays as we get towards the end of the year. I start to give you the essays that were given most recently. This was an essay from, I think, two years ago, three years ago, and it threw everybody for a loop. I, will, I guess my argument is for an American audience to have a... A character named Pickle is disconcerting. It, it throws you off track. If you can only imagine writing an AP essay where all of a sudden you have this prompt and all of a sudden someone's named, uh, you know, titles The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle and you haven't ra really wrapped your mind around it, you don't know what you're reading. Like, is this some, remember the, the talking pineapple prompt we talked about a couple of years ago? Anyway, this uh, prompt is one of those that kind of threw everybody from loop. It's interesting. Um, you'll notice right away that it deals with the sword fight. We just dealt with an essay about a sword fight. Um, I, that's not something, it's not a theme I'm trying to uh, impress upon you. Uh, usually they'd be scattered about, but because um, the coronavirus has kind of modified my schedule, they just, uh, I'm giving you two essays with sword fighting in the last couple of weeks. Um, this one's a little bit different. It still kind of has those same elements where you challenge someone you know for your honor and so you're going to kind of throw down and have a fight it's going to present present it in a much different way and the trick for you is to pick up what is happening what is the author actually trying to demonstrate um, and what is the situation present to um, you as a reader what's the comp complex deep meaning that we can get from this so i want you to read it i'm looking just for an introductory paragraph right i'm looking i'm just trying to practice getting your ideas wrapped around some sort of central theme and um, develop that idea. But I'm not asking for the body paragraphs, right? So give me some context. Let me know what's happening in the passage, what you understand about it, and then set it up to present your thesis that, of course, is defensible. It's going to argue a point and then drive that point home. Um, but, of course, I'm not asking for body paragraphs. I just want to see where you're going with it and what you're going to extract from it. And then we'll go from there. Um, outside that, let me know. If you have any questions, I'm here to help out. Um, Talk to me on Teams or email me, whatever I can do. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. I, um, I try to be as quick as possible. Usually around 24 hours, I'm usually getting back to you. Um, but if you want to, if you need more work to do, if you want to practice essays, I'd be help, happy to help out. But that's really what I have planned for next week is to just start practicing from here on out. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, have a good week.